what is next, Houston Howard on Superstory and uh, the transition to transmedia. I, I'm, I'm not even going to begin attempting to explain it. I'm going to, Houston, can we just check in? Oh, do, I can see you're in the green room, but are you there? Can you hear us? Can you see us? I can oh. hear you. I can't see anything but my own presentation. That's right. That's fantastic. That's, that's all we need to know. So, um, Houston, I'm going to yes. hand over to you. Um, uh, have a great hour and a half, and, or an hour and a bit, sorry, um, and, or whatever it is. <laughs> I can see confusion on your face. Sure. Okay. I'm trying to do the maths in my head. <laughs> gotcha. um, okay, however long it is, Fine. it's fantastic, and we'll see you at the end. Awesome, thank you. Cool. Um, happy to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, really looking forward to uh, to discussing all the crazy things that are going on uh, in the world uh, of, of Superstory and Transmedia. I'm uh, coming to you from the sunny West Coast uh, in Los Angeles, specifically uh, Burbank, California. Uh, and, um, you know, just I'm, I'm quarantined just like everybody else is, though they, they have started letting people outside to do various things uh, as of yesterday, which is kind of cool. So, um, so anyway, just as the, the, the typical disclaimers go, you may hear my dog bark or my six-year-old walk in the background, uh, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, and uh, typically how I do these sections and uh, in, in these sessions is I, uh, you know, we've, we've all been to, we've all been to conferences that, uh, that, you know, you, you spend three days at and you walk away with, you know, an hour's worth of value. Uh, I'm not saying this one is like this, but, but typically, you know, conferences go like that. So my philosophical stance on these sessions is that I try to flip it and try to give you three days worth of value in a single hour. So I wildly over prepare. I have way too much information, uh, but I like to err on the side of giving you too much, uh, rather than, uh, than, than too little. So, um, so uh, uh, I, th I believe on Friday we're having a, a dedicated Q and A session. Uh, so uh, I'm going to fire hose a bunch of content at, content at you today. Uh, you're going to have a zillion questions, uh, and I really encourage you all to show up at the uh, the Q and A on Friday uh, so that we can um, uh, I can really contextualize it for you and your project. Um, I, actually, the, the I'm the biggest fan of Q&A. I like Q&A more than sort of the just the presentation aspect of it because it really allows me to, to tailor and make everything contextual to you. Uh, so I encourage you guys um, to uh, to be a part of that and do that. So uh, so I'm here to talk to you today about the game-changing power of Superstory, otherwise known as creating entertainment for today, not 1997, though I admit 1997 was pretty awesome. Uh, but Unfortunately, we're not there. We're in 2020. Um, so uh, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Houston Howard, uh, not Howard Houston. Houston's my first name, like Whitney or the city. Uh, and I uh, I came into entertainment, just a little bit of a comic book origin story for you all. Uh, I came into entertainment through a, through a different path. I originally started uh, as a lawyer and um, uh, uh went to law school on the East Coast uh, in Virginia, uh, uh, focused on entertainment law uh, there. And then much to my mother-in-law's chagrin, uh, decided to uh, come out to LA, uh, get on the other side of the, the entertainment transaction and start to write and produce. And uh, then, you know, several years into putting projects together and, uh, uh, you know, writing scripts and really focusing on sort of that level of education, uh, I um, fell into this space called transmedia, uh, and uh, which I typically refer to as super story because transmedia is a funny word. Um, but I grew up in you know the late 80s, early 90s as fan of multi-platform projects. I loved, uh, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and He-Man and uh, G.I. Joe and big fan of Star Wars. I uh, grew up reading Lord of the Rings and I'm a fan of big IP. I'm a fan of, of, of stories that live on uh, beyond just single mediums and single platforms. And so when when I got into film and television, I wanted to basically ma just make what I liked. And um, so, uh, so that led me into this space of how do you do that? 
And it was wildly frustrating because not a lot of people would tell me how to do it. And there wasn't sort of a defined rubric. Uh, so I went uh, and, and, you know, took a couple years of auditing the space and figure out a creative process that worked for me. And I ended up writing a couple books uh, that, uh, that, that did pretty well. My first book um, was Make Your Story Really Stinking Big. This was actually published by Michael Weesey. Uh, it was one of the first books on the market that, um, that was a crate manual for, uh, for writers and producers to take an idea and shepherd it into a multi-platform world. Uh, then a year or so ago, I released my second book uh, called You're Going to Need a Bigger Story, which is basically the updated version of the first one. Uh, it, uh, it, it's, it has a ton more content and really updated for today, uh, even more than the first one. So, um, so both of these, um, uh, both of these books did well. And they're, they're continuing to do well. I speak all over the world on um, about the power of transmedia and using multiple platforms as a way to leverage your scripts and leverage your movies and and to be able to re-leverage uh, uh, the power away from the studio and, and, and to you as a creator. Uh, and um, once I released the book, I was able to start working with a lot of really cool people. Uh, I have a company called One Three Creative, and we develop our own projects and develop uh, in-house multi-platform concepts that exist on film and television, but at the same time, music and games and 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 digital platforms and things like that. Um, but uh, also, you know, have been able to uh, work with a lot of really cool people. Uh, Mattel on their Monster High project, um, uh, the Disney Imagineers, Fox, CBS, a variety of independent producers television showrunners, etc. A lot of uh, uh, novelists and a lot of really interesting people in the music industry, video game industry, etc. And so I kind of bounce around uh, entertainment and look at entertainment a little bit differently than, than so some of the folks that you've probably heard speak already because I am i don't have a, a film focus. Uh, film tips typically is like the load-bearing wall, to, so to speak, of, of what we do. Um, but uh, but I have this elevated perspective that, that uh, I think is kind of interesting interesting and hopefully you'll be able to walk away with some um with some uh some new perspective today so um so uh I want to first use the general premise of uh, what transmedia is, and uh, so so uh, what I'm talking about, what it is, and what it isn't, and then we're going to go into a bunch of reasons why this is important, and how it can help you. Um, and so when we're talking about this concept of transmedia uh, and multi-platform content, what I call a super story, um, uh, transmedia actually, just as an aside, is what the Producers Guild of America here in Hollywood, the PGA, has ratified a transmedia producer credit for people that uh, that extend uh, stories into multiple mediums. And so the, that term transmedia still is a little, even though it's clunky and weird, uh, it's still relevant as far as the industry goes. Um, Transmedia is the art of extending a story across multiple mediums and multiple platforms. Uh, so you're now integrating a variety of mediums uh, into an IP or into a brand and uh, in, in a way that creates an ecosystem of content. And so this, as we'll talk about, creates a completely different experience for the audience and a different business model for the creators. And it gets pretty exciting pretty fast. Um, so, but before we dive into what it what what it is uh i like to expose you to what what it isn't and uh because i feel like this frames it a little bit better for you so what transmedia isn't is multimedia okay this is this seems like a hair split but i think it's a, it's it's, a, it's an important split uh traditional hollywood is built on the multimedia franchise the 80s and 90s that was built upon the back of the multimedia franchise where you have a book and that book becomes a movie and uh and that movie then is adapted into a video game or whatever and it's the same story over and over and over again so uh so uh what we have is um say we have a movie that has a story, okay? Then that same story, if successful, is then uh, made into a video game, made into a book, made into you know a, a concept album or a podcast or something like that, right? It's the same story over, over, and over, and over, and over again. Um, what transmedia is, actually, is uh, where maybe you have a story in your movie. And then instead of telling the same story in a video game, you actually, the movie sets up a different story in the video game. Uh, and then that story in the video game spins off into a different story in the, uh, in the novel. And that novel then culminates uh, into maybe a concept album through music that wraps everything up. And we have 
different stories in different mediums that all work together, right? To tell one big story. And what this does is it creates one big ecosystem of content, okay? And so uh, we can liken it now to what Marvel's doing, what Star Wars is doing. So the big franchise things really lean into this model heavily. Um, but uh, the principles of what we're talking about uh, really impact uh, uh, everybody, no matter what budget, what scale you are, where you are at in your career, uh, even if you're just, you know, you just written one script and that's it, you can still leverage these principles uh, it, to create your own ecosystem of content. Uh, you know, just listen to the BoJack Horseman uh, uh, case study. It's really interesting how uh, BoJack Horseman didn't start as a cartoon on, net on Netflix. It started uh, as a web series, right? And then was able to sort of grow into some other things. And so, so ultimately at the heart of it, Transmedia is using all the tools at our disposal to tell more story and to leverage a new model uh, in, 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 into our projects. And so, uh, so this ecosystem aspect is, is super, super, super important. Um, though a lot of people think that the transmedia is just new media, and that's not true. Uh, new media is just sort of the cool tech that's out. Uh, the VR, the AR, the, you know, uh, uh, the, you know, whatever the, the immersive thing is or the digital thing is. Um, and that's not exactly the case because transmedia really is more of a philosophy of design than anything. And so transmedia is very platform agnostic. You can have a 100% analog transmedia experience um, uh, because really transmedia is just the philosophy of saying, I don't just have one thing. I need to extend my script into multiple things. And, and those can be the cool digital new hotness of the day, or it could be, you know, something completely 100% analog. So a lot of people use that term transmedia in regards to web series and, 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 you know, 3d virtual reality, augmented reality, things like that. It's not always, uh, always the case. Um, it's not merchandising. Most people think that the transmedia is just merchandising. You make a bunch of toys or T-shirts that go along with uh, with your project, and uh, that's not and, and it's not necessarily the case. Uh, transmedia is all about storytelling and extending the story in a new way. And if you don't extend the story in a new way, you're really not doing transmedia. Now you can transmediate merchandise in a really interesting way. And um, uh, for example, me and my company, we were uh, brought in. Um, I don't know if you guys ever heard of the the toy Slinky, right? Slinky is this old school toy. And the Slinky company uh, pulled us in to build out um, the, the the sort of the creative story world of Slinky because uh, they wanted to build it into a, like a Lego sort of a project. And so uh, so we were working with them on, on their on their you know, their story world and some of the creative aspects of, of what they want to accomplish. And I was sitting with the president of Slinky and uh, he was saying, um, uh, you know, we want slinky cartoons and we want slinky uh, uh, movies and we want slinky uh, video games and we want slinky shower curtains. And and I said, well, we can help you with the cartoons and the movies and the video games and things like that, but we don't really do shower curtains. And he, and he said, well, why not? And, and I said, well, everything that we do is part of how to build a bigger narrative tapestry and and if 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 the shower curtain doesn't tell a story then it's not what we do it's just merchandising it's licensing and he said well how would you how would you fix it and i said well if you wanted to transmediate a shower curtain you would have to figure out when you make the shower curtain what's a specific part of the story that you could reserve just for the shower curtain what can you do that uh that um you know, is it a character backstory that you reveal in a shower curtain? Is it a new character that you introduce in the shower curtain? Is it a new uh, part of the story world that you can include on the shower curtain? I said, if that's the case, then all of a sudden the shower curtain becomes a piece of the puzzle of the larger uh, uh, narrative tapestry and it's valuable. Uh, so then you shouldn't stop it there. Maybe you download the Slinky app and take it to the shower curtain and hold your phone up to the shower curtain and a map pops out via augmented reality and you take that map uh, that you get from the shower curtain, you go play the console video game and use that map in the console video game to uh, to unlock a new level that then uh, new information is revealed that then reveal, takes you to a web series and et cetera, et cetera. 
Now we're talking about a, a narrative ecosystem using all these different platforms, and it's very different than um, than what he was expecting. And so, uh, so this is sort of the interesting opportunity. I think you can transmediate merchandise, and it's a big opportunity because there's a financial opportunity. Uh, but if you always use things to extend the story and wrap them into the narrative tapestry, uh, you're going to find that you're going to get a better experience down the road. So that's just a little bit of an introduction, basically, uh, of, of what transmedia is. It's the art of telling stories across multiple mediums and platforms, but in a way that where all these stories work together for one ecosystem of content, okay? So your big question right now is why? Why do we have to do this? Uh, like what, like it seems like a lot of work. It seems complicated. Why can't I just write my script? And this is, this is the perfect question to ask. Uh, and I want to, I want to deal with this really quickly uh, because uh, I'm sure as you guys have heard, as you guys have witnessed uh, everything in the world is changing, uh, especially in entertainment. So before the coronavirus, before COVID-19, the, the most often, the repeated phrase that I would hear from uh, executives is Rome is burning. Rome is burning because everything is being disrupted. And uh, technology is forcing change in Hollywood. Culture is forcing change in Hollywood. The economics, just how business is done is forcing change in Hollywood. And so for, for the past two, three years before coronavirus, uh, Tech, uh, uh, Hollywood was 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 changing almost every single day, uh, and everybody's freaking out. You, I mean, there was so much fear on the executive level just based on the change over uh, that that nobody knows what to do because audiences are changing, platforms are changing, everything's changing, uh, and now we get into COVID. And then po what the post COVID marketplace is going to be like now, everything is changing even more. And we see the vulnerability of uh, having all your eggs in one basket. We see the vulnerability of the theatrical model. We th see the vulnerability in investments. We th see the vulnerability in, in, you know, in, in the music industry and in concerts and live events and things like this. Now everybody's rethinking everything because of, of what's going on. And so the biggest failing that I see in, in uh, screenwriters today is uh, is that they're still writing screenplays like it's 1997 or 2005 or 2012 or even even 2017 because they they even though the they're similar obviously similar similar principles that go into the craft the industry is so different and that what they're doing is they're creating product for an industry that really. Is, is, is different like it, it's for it's it, it's for a completely different machine and all of a sudden when you try to push that 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 round peg into the square hole it doesn't work right and you don't understand as a screenwriter why isn't my stuff selling why am i not getting an agent why am i not doing this and it's because a lot of times you're well a lot of times it's just not good enough right but, but presuming that it's good enough uh uh and you got your craft where you want it. A lot of times, it's it's not about your talent or the craft. It's about the 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 model that you're using to be able to leverage the entertainment just isn't right for the buyer. And um and this how is is why everything is changing. And technology is forced to change. COVID is forced to change. And if you, we don't adapt as screenwriters to create different product uh, for different buyers, uh, then then we're going to be struggling. And we have to figure out how to change with the times okay so what we've seen now the biggest change it is all throughout history hollywood has stayed in a bubble where normal market forces has not affected it the like like hollywood's been able to do its own thing uh but now in today's market technology has popped that bubble culture has popped that bubble and all of a sudden hollywood is now uh uh at odds and trying to deal with normal market forces. The biggest market force that that Hollywood is dealing with is this thing called commoditization, which is a big fancy word for oversaturation. And there's an oversaturation of the market. And so before, 10 years ago, you would write a screenplay, make a movie, release that movie, and you were by yourself, it was cool. The marketplace is, is everybody's spread out. Everybody's doing good social distancing. Uh, but today's market, is now more like 
this. So in a day where anybody can write a movie, anybody can write a screenplay, anybody can self-publish a novel, anybody can release a video game, the entertainment market is more crowded than ever, ever, ever before. So look at a couple of these stats. There's 50 million songs on Apple Music right now. 50 million, right? Uh, which is in, in an era when anybody can make music, there's a lot of music out there, right? Um, 40 million books on Amazon in an era where anybody can publish and distribute a book. There's lots of books. There are 1.2 million video games available to the public right now. And there are last year, 736 films just released in the theater just last year, just in the theater. Doesn't even count all the crappy Netflix movies or, or the straight to DVD stuff. 736 theatrical films released last year, right? Why am I talking about books and movies and things like this? Guys, entertainment is, is all about fighting for the attention of the audience. And it, right now, there's so much competition for the, uh, the, the, for the audience's attention it, that we, we are now competing as filmmakers. We're competing with video games and music and books and all these other things just to buy times and people, just to buy space in people's head. The president of Netflix was, was asked who his biggest competition is. Is it Apple? Is it Disney? Is it uh, Hulu? Who is it? He said, none of them. Our biggest competition is Fortnite, the video game. Why is Fortnite the biggest competition for Netflix? Is because if you're playing Fortnite, you're not watching Netflix, right? So now movie studios are competing in as video games for the attention of the audience, and we have to understand that, right? But we're living in a really interesting time where all these mediums and platforms are converging on each other. Uh, Bandersnatch, is it a movie? Is it a video game? Uh, I saw a, a billboard here in Hollywood not too long ago. It said Bob's Burgers, the album. Right. And and it's not the soundtrack. It's like a standalone musical album that goes along with Bob Burgers. Uh, it, it You look at the 100 most profitable, successful entertainment brands uh, in history. Every single one of them use mul uses multiple platforms. Are they movie brands or video game brands? Well, they're entertainment brands and they diversify. Everything is kind of folding on top of each other in a really interesting way. And if you look at the buyers, we have Netflix, Amazon, Apple, right? AT&T bought Warner Brothers last year, which is absolutely mind-bogglingly weird, right? We have Comcast, uh, uh, Disney, right? Like we're, we're all going to bow to the great mouse one day, right? If you look at the new studios and pay attention to their business models, their business models are different, right? They just have a vibe about the different structure about they work at Netflix just isn't film and television. They own a comic book company. They own a mobile game company. They're producing uh, published material. They're producing not they're, they're publishing novels and, and comic books and video games to go along with their film and television. And they're pulling it into their own ecosystem. Right. Uh, look at the over when we're talking about the oversaturation. Look at this. This is this is now post, this is pre COVID numbers. So we'll see how these will change. But HBO Max, by the end of 2020, they wanted to uh, release 70 new shows by the end of 2020. Disney wanted to release 50 new shows by the end of 2020. Peacock with NBC, 50 new shows. Uh, uh, Apple TV, which I've been super impressed with, by the way, uh, wants to release 50 new shows by the end of uh, 2020. Netflix, by the end of 2020, wanted to have 700 Netflix originals produced. If you look at these numbers, we've never seen this amount of entertainment ever produced all at the same time ever before in human history, right? It's so overcrowded and so crazy. Look at this. Netflix released more originals in 2019 than the entire TV industry did in 2005. 371 series movies represents a 50% increase in streaming service just over 2018. And now all this is going to get even worse. I'm going to say worse because it's awesome for the audience. Is, is it going to get heightened even more because of the, the, the pivot into streaming? And so why do we care about this? We care about this because of the law of supply and demand. Law of supply and demand is this really basic principle that, that says when the demand is higher than the supply, the supplier is in Kentucky, I'm from originally from Kentucky, and you call that being in the catbird seat, right? You're in an advantageous uh, position. It's it's uh, uh, when the supply out, or when the demand outpaces the supply, you're under no incentive to adapt or change or lower your price. You actually can increase your price, right, and stay exactly the same. But 
when the supply begins to outpace the demand, now the supplier has to start figuring out how do I change? How do I lower my price? How do I get to get be more competitive? How do I innovate my product? How do I change? How do I adapt? If I don't, I'm going to go out of business if I keep, keep doing the same thing. The big thing for screenwriters to understand right now is for the first time in the history of entertainment and the first time, uh, and, and listen, I'm not being hyperbolic about this, literally for the first time in human history, entertainment the demand for entertainment has been outpaced by the, by the supply. There is more entertainment now than any one person can ever consume ever a day in their life, right? They, like we can't watch all the movies on Netflix. We can't watch uh, all the, the TV shows on Amazon. We can't read every book on Amazon. We can't play all the games on Steam. Uh, and now the supply has outpaced the demand, which is for the first time ever has caused creators to step back and say, oh, wow. How do I compete differently, right? How do I begin to, you know, alter my strategy? Because listen, y'all, I'm not saying don't write script uh, scripts. Don't don't go into the film business, right? Like that. Like one, if 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 you were if you were put on this earth to write movies and make movies, you do that until you die, right? Regardless of what the market is. But but there's still there's a tremendous market for entertainment, so it's a great business to go into. Obviously, uh, we just figure have to figure out how to adapt. And so I so think about it like this: if you're the only lemonade stand in town, and you and and, and you can charge whatever you want, you can charge. Uh, uh, you, you can have only lemonade. There's no competition. You walk outside one day and there's two other lemonade stands in town. You say, hey, well, I'll cut my price a little bit, but I can outpunch these other, you know, these other lemonade stands. It's just two of them. No, no big deal. You walk out the next day and there's 100. You walk out the next day and there's 10,000 lemonade stands all in your neighborhood. Don't, I'm not telling you not to make lemonade. I'm saying, don't you understand that you have to now approach the whole process of creating lemonade and having the business in a completely different way, especially if you're operating on like the independent scene, right? Uh, so, so this is the mindset I want us to have, right? Uh, how do we compete in this market? You're not competing in the 1997 market. You're not competing in the 2005 market. You're not competing in the 1976 market. You're not even competing in the 2018 market. We're now have to compete in the 2020 market, which is so different, so new. We have to learn how to be more fluid. We have to learn how to have not all of our basket, right? We have to fight for the comp for the the engagement and the and the attention of the audience in a new way. Um, and we got to make our stuff. We got to make our stuff more attractive to buyers. Right. Uh, and so so the biggest thing, especially like when you're when you're talking about trying to sell something to the to 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 Netflix or sell something to a production studio or or to get an investment from an investor, you think that the decision making factors are is your script good enough? Right. That is part of the decision making. If you make crap, you're probably not going to sell. But really, the biggest decision making factor in in whether your script gets acquired, whether you get the investment, whether you get, whether you get put on as a screenwriter, right, is is risk. How risky are you? Are you the bridge on the left or are you the bridge on the right? And I'm telling you, it, it everything in Hollywood is control. Is, the decisions are made based on fear, right? Because you could have the most awesome, progressive, cool indie script that breaks new boundaries in a hundred different ways. And it's the new hotness on the scene. You can have that and you can get it in front of an executive. That same executive sees also gets a different script, which is the reboot of the Brady Bunch, right? Which we know is will be solidly mediocre at best, right? It given all things considered, that studio executive, 99 times out of 100, is going to opt for the reboot of the Brady Bunch, even though your script is better. Why? Because there's brand value. There's established pre-awareness in the, in the market. And, uh, and all of a sudden, in a hyper-competitive market, in an oversaturated market, everybody begins to fall back to safety. What's the safe play? What if, if I if I produce if I take a chance on the cool edgy script 
right? Uh, then uh, that the, the nobody knows the screenwriter and nobody know, uh, it's not based on branded IP. And if it goes bad, who gets the blame? I could be blamed and then I lose my job and I lose my health insurance and my kids can't go to private school and I can't pay my mortgage, right? That's the calculation that the studio executive has. But if they green like the, the, the Brady Bunch and it fails, because of course it will, because it's the Brady Bunch, then what like then all of a sudden that studio executive can say, wait a minute, hold on. It's not my fault that this thing failed. The 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 the, the it's the fault of the director, it's the fault of the producer, the screenwriter, or somebody else. It's not my fault because I went with the less risky option because everybody knows what the Brady Bunch is. It has pre-awareness in the market. This is why things uh, uh, are based on books, right? Uh, because it's not because they're the best stories. It's because the studios look at those books and say they have a built-in fan base. They have already a brand awareness in, in the market. And so, uh, uh, and so it's the less risky option, right? And so now, and that's the way it's always been, but really now in a hyper-competitive market, this is even more important than ever before right we have to figure out even before you go to sell the script how can you begin to have your story i'm not talking about you necessarily like as a, a social media influencer or anything but how do you begin to like seed your story into the market to start uh getting some uh pre-awareness generated to start getting some audience generated to start building brand presence because brand presence in a commoditized market is the the way forward right i had a listen to this this will freak you all out i have a buddy at warner brothers who who told me uh he said when they when, at warner brothers when they can't decide uh between two scripts which ones to make and which one not to make uh what they do is they'll go to the instagram accounts of the authors and Whichever one has has the most uh, uh, Instagram followers will make that movie. Warner Brothers. That is that. I mean, that that's that's incredible, right? Uh, because it, it's when you have pre awareness in the market, then all of a sudden risk decreases. So my 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 encouragement to all you screenwriters out there is is before you go and start shopping your scripts. Before you before you try to, you know, go embark on the journey of, of selling something into Hollywood, take the time to use all the platforms that are at that are at our disposal today and begin to establish that brand in the uh, in uh, uh, in the marketplace. Right. In some valuable way. Right. Because a hundred different platforms that you can use that make ultimately what your uh, uh, you know what your conversation ultimately is with with the studio. Right now, trying to sell a script right now that has zero brand awareness and you don't have any brand awareness, and if you don't get an, an actor attachment, right? Uh, because listen, if you have a, a completely original script, uh, if you get the rock to attach to it. Then you know you can you can you know you can get it made um, because the rock brings the pre awareness the rock shifts the shifts the risk the problem is it's hard to get meaningful attachments I mean just a practical problem uh, especially if you're not in Hollywood even if you're in Hollywood it's hard to get uh, it's hard to get uh, attachment so you have to shift the risk in some way if you if you if you're not uh, excuse my American football analogy here, uh, but uh, uh, it's like standing back on your own one yard line and tossing a Hail Mary all the way down the field, right? Or, uh, you know, I, I, I would use a, a proper uh, football analogy if, if I didn't screw it up. Uh, but, but you get what I'm saying. It's a Hail Mary pass. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But if you take the time to begin using multiple platforms to begin establishing your story in the marketplace through all the platforms that are popping in culture right now, that are contextual, that that are cool, that 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 fit you, that fit the, the you know where the audiences are. All of a sudden, you start marching that ball down the field. So eventually, it's not a hail mary. Uh, uh, from the one, maybe it's a Hail Mary from the 50, uh, but, but you just increase your chances in a meaningful way. So, so, uh, so this becomes the conversation of how do we, how do we do that, right? How do we really take advantage of this model and how do we recognize what a, uh, what a transmedia project is, right? So the key components of it, but, but I'm telling you all, you don't understand. I mean, I've, 
I've so for example, example, I was in a uh, I, I had a meeting down in West Hollywood um, several months ago, but uh, back when you could go to things called coffee shops, uh, it seems like a hundred years ago. But um, uh, I was I was waiting on on somebody, and behind me there was a um, there was a guy having a meeting with a company, and 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 one of the things you learn early in your Hollywood uh, uh, existence is. Uh, you learn how to eavesdrop really, really well. And so eavesdropping is so, is so valuable. So I'm sitting there waiting my, for the person to show up for my meeting and I'm dropping some eaves on the people behind me. And uh, and this guy was, he, he, had, he had written a television pilot. He, he had been trying for five years to sell his pilot and nobody would acquire it. And so he was meeting with a company <clears throat> that was actually buying it, which was super cool. But they weren't buying it for film and television. They were buying it for um, uh, interactive Alexa audio dramas, right? So old school radio dramas, but interactive through Alexa. And they were they came to a deal in principle. They were going to acquire his pilot script for thirty thousand dollars. And I'm rooting for this guy. I'm like, that's awesome. This dude just sold something. It's been five years. He's been shopping this thing, same thing. Uh, that's amazing. And um, so then he's happy. Their lawyers are going to get in contact, work out the deals. He walks away. Uh, he walks away. The people keep talk from the company. They keep talking. And um, I keep eavesdropping. And super interesting what their business model is. They do interactive Alexa audio dramas. The first episode is for free. The rest of the episodes uh, are then like on some sort of cheap subscription model. And um and they acquire film and television scripts uh, 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 around town that just haven't sold. And they turn them into Alexa audio dramas, right? But then they keep talking. And that isn't ultimately what their business model is. After they, after they establish them as audio dramas on Alexa, guess what they do? They aggregate. They look at which ones aggregate audience. And the ones that are aggregating the most audience... Guess what they then go do? They take the script that they already have the rights to now, and it's a complete buyout, right? They then go shop that as film and television. And when they shop it as film and television, all of a sudden, they can get that acquired, and, and not one word of the script changed. What changed? The risk changed because they established audience pre-awareness. Now, 20 years ago, you couldn't establish audience pre-awareness. Today, you absolutely can establish audience pre-awareness because, uh, because the platforms are there. And so, one, I was thinking, wow, that's a really super smart business model on the, on, on, uh, uh, in, in regards to that company. And, and, but then my second thought was, why couldn't that screenwriter, why couldn't that screenwriter have done that uh, himself? Right? He could have. He could have gone and taken the 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 five hours to ten hours to seventeen to twenty two hours to learn how to make an Alexa app. They call them Alexa skills. They don't call them apps for whatever reason, right? He could have figured out how to do that, and he could have generated his own pre awareness. Why couldn't he have done that? Of course, he could have done that, right? Well, th the reason people don't do that is because they view themselves as just a screenwriter. As this is all I do. I, I, I'm a screenwriter and, and I've hold myself in as a screenwriter. I don't want to go learn that new thing. I don't want to. I want to do my I want to write my five pages a day. And then I just want to throw the Hail Mary from the one yard line. And that's it. Right. But. It's absolutely crazy. If you look at the technology that's available to us, the platforms that are available to us, what what is like we can create so much content and we have free worldwide distribution to connect directly to audiences. It's absolutely mind bogglingly crazy that we don't leverage that. And so access to audiences used to be impossible. That's the reason you had to go to a studio. It's the reason you had to go to the big companies is because they, that the, the means of production had not been democratized. The means of distribution had not been democratized. So, so you had to go to the people that had the resources to be able to do it. Today, the means of production have been democratized. I just saw the new red camera that was announced, uh, a 6K Komodo red, red, uh, red camera, $6,000, right? That you can just purchase it outright, which is absolutely crazy. Um, and then beyond that, you could probably rent it for a couple hundred bucks for a weekend if you're you know if you're here in a place like LA. And so just the fact that you can do that and what we have with our phones and our laptops and I don't know if you guys saw the Apple commercial where the director from John Wick shot the snowball fight with his kids. Um 
it, it, it's incredible what you can do. And the fact that we have distribution into platforms that connect directly to audiences. Now, if you build the audience yourself, now you have the leverage and the brand awareness to be able to sell the script. Now, I'm not talking about, again, personal like social media influencers. I'm talking about getting people hooked on your story, getting people invested in your story, getting people to fall in love with your characters before they see them on, on, on film. Right. And, uh, you know, whether that's the, the two hottest things right now that are that are that are uh, getting optioned in Hollywood short stores on Wattpad, W-A-T-T pad. It's, it's like YouTube for short stories, uh, uh, short stories from Wattpad and podcasts. Right. The two hottest things being being uh, optioned right now, 80 plus podcasts were optioned for um, uh, uh, film and television last year. So all you screenwriters that are slaving away over your spec script right now or have been shopping that same spec script for years. Right. Podcast that a lot of times don't even have a, a film script to go along with it are being optioned, not because they have the script because they don't. It's because they have the audience. Right. And this is like a bummer to most of us when we first start hearing this. Because because you're like I'm a screener I don't want to I don't want to learn how to do all this stuff and this is the mind shift the, the mindset shift that I want you guys to understand now today in a commoditized entertainment market you can't just be the screenwriter anymore you have to elevate yourself above that and become a storyteller you're a storyteller above anything right now you may focus on screenwriting but you're a storyteller above everything else. Right. And once you start to identify yourself as a storyteller and, and an entrepreneur in, in, in a meaningful way, then all of a sudden you start to get a different perspective. I'm completely bullish on the fact that if a screenwriter adopts the mentality of an entrepreneur, that they're going to be that they're more successful because we see it all the time. Right. Don't wait for the studio to give you the green light. Don't wait for the investment. Go ahead and leverage uh, the, the platforms that we have today, whether it's a web series, whether it's short stories on Wattpad, podcast, whether uh, it's TikTok videos. TikTok is this incredible thing. You say, well, TikTok's just for 13 year olds to do funny dances on. True. Right now it is. But guess what? I don't know if you guys saw the news yesterday. The, the head of Disney Plus, the guy that launched Disney Plus for for uh, for. Um, uh, for Disney became the CEO of Instagram, just like Facebook, just like everything else. What you're going to see is a maturation of TikTok into a legitimate streaming platform. If you can be early in and start to aggregate audience, I'm telling you all that all of a sudden you're going to have a different conversation when you go to sell that script. Right. And so, uh, so this is just an important thing uh, because if you ever known anybody that an entrepreneur that started a coffee shop or a pizza shop or a read, First to learn, just to figure it out, right? Entrepreneurs understand. I gotta hustle. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta. You know, I, I still have my focus of what I want to do, but I have to figure out how to learn all this new stuff and work inordinate hours to figure out how to get this shop open and be successful in today's market. Screenwriters, if all you do is write your five pages a day, and you and you haven't, and you haven't made a zillion dollars already in your bank account telling you it's a hard road. It's a hard road, right? You're waiting on that big check to come. You're waiting on the Hail Mary and, and maybe it happens or more likely what happens is you're going to find yourself 30 years from now or 20 years from now in a pub and you're angry and you're surly and, you can, and, and, you, and you're saying, well, my stuff is always better than everybody else's. Listen to this. The market right now is so amazing because of our access to audiences. Access to the industry has been solved which means we have no excuse. We have no excuse not to start le leveraging all the different uh, 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 aspects of the entertainment into uh, uh, into building our audience so that we can then flip it into film and te television later. Like if if you can't do it now with the, the, the miracles that we have at our fingertips as far as free worldwide distribution, uh, free uh, amazing things to, 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 to create and, and produce with, if we can't leverage those things, it's not an access problem. It's a discipline problem. You don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to learn. You don't want to do this stuff. And so you're like, now you have no excuse, but now also listen, the big cool thing about this is, is now no one can keep you out. Before, 15 people in the entertainment industry used to make all the decisions about who made, uh, uh, what got put on and what didn't get put on. Now, 
It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how inexperienced you are. It doesn't matter about your color, your age, your creed, your religion, your sexual orientation. It doesn't matter where you are. It used to be, you have to be in LA, you have to be in New York. Now you can be from Iowa. You can be from London. You can be from wherever. You can be from wherever. And if you build audience, you're in the game. That's the thing that, that, that leverages everything is audience, 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 right? And so, but the key here is is we have to learn how to expand our story, right? We have to learn how to give 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 more of our story in different platforms. It's not adaptation. It's not multimedia. It's not just promotion stuff. It's how do I tell, a, a, you know, I have my feature film script, but how before my feature film script comes out, how do I uh, uh, start to like seed the story maybe from different characters' point of view in short stories? How do I create a podcast that, that gives a different aspect and entry point? And so, and, and all works together in an ecosystem. This is the key, story expansion that's coordinated. So when I was a kid, big Star Wars fan, still a Star, Star Wars fan, but when I was a kid, my mom got me this book, which was the adaptation of the original trilogy, right? Um, uh, which... I read, but like I already knew the story. So it was cool, but you know, I already knew the story. But if you remember from Star Wars in Empire Strikes Back, there's a scene where Darth Vader is looking for Han Solo and he has all these different bounty hunters that uh, that that he's talking to to be able to uh, catch Han Solo. And Boba Fett is the one who does. And we don't see any of the other four guys ever again in the movies. They disappear, right? Um, so what happened to them? Well, one day my mom brought me home a different book. Right. That different book was Star Wars Tales of the Bounty Hunters, which was short stories about all those other bounty hunters that you never heard again in, in the movie. You now see what happened to them in the books. Right. And, 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 and uh, you know, the anthology of short stories and yeah, they cross over in a really interesting way. It shows how Boba Fett screwed them all over. Right. All this extra stuff that you don't see in the movies. And and the principle I want you to take home with this is, do you understand as a fan how much more valuable this is to me, right? Uh, uh, it, this is a hundred times more valuable to me simply because it's extra and new Star Wars stuff, right? Extra and new Star Wars stuff, which which is cool. Now, can you do this without uh, if if uh, if you have something that's not Star Wars or sci-fi? Of course you can. Same principles apply, right? And so, uh, but but audiences value new story more than just repurposed story. So this is why we have to find these 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 entry points uh, and these jumping off points to figure out how to extend the story uh, in a valuable way. Always learning something new. Right. And, and so what happens is when every single touch point, whether it's a book or a podcast or whatever it is. Uh, and listen, with a book, guess what? Book for zero dollars today. Right. So you have no excuse not to be able to leverage something like this, uh, which which is cool. Um, but but every touch point has to have what's called additive comprehension, which means every like every touch point, you have to learn something new and learn something valuable, right? Uh, think of it like additive comprehension. Think of it as, as a holy crap moment for the fans, right? So like something significant happens in this, in this new thing, in the book or the podcast or whatever. Uh, and that's exclusive to the single story. So this then makes sure, make sure that if your podcast has an exclusive plot point or something interesting that happens you can only get listened to in the podcast you can't get it in the movie you can't get it anywhere else that's going to make sure people want to listen to your podcast right and so everything has to be significant so um so uh i love star wars i don't read a lot of comics um but uh uh i like comics i'm just not like a lineup at this comic shop every wednesday to get the new comic top of a guy uh but my buddy one day uh, uh contacted me and said um uh he said, uh, have you read Star Wars number seven, the, the new Star Wars Marvel comics? And I said, no, I haven't read that yet. And I'm not a huge comic guy. He said, well, can I spoil it for you? I said, sure. And he said, well, in Star Wars number seven, you're introduced to Han Solo's wife. And I said, oh, yeah, you're introduced to Princess Leia. He said, no, 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 no. Like, it's a different woman. And what you find out is Han Solo's been married to a different woman the entire time and no one ever knew it, Right. And I said, really? I've read the books. I've watched the movies. I played the video games. I played the role playing games. Like nowhere does it does it reveal Han Solo's secret wife. He said, well, she's in Star Wars number seven. So what do you think I did? 
I didn't just go get Star Wars number seven. I went and got Star Wars number one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, right? To eventually find and be introduced to Sana Solo. So here she is. One, it like look at his face there. If you can see, uh, if, if my screen's cut up, uh, that you, you see Han Solo. This is what happens when you get uh, when you get busted. Um, but uh, one, you were, you're you're introduced to this new character, Sana Solo, which is his secret wife, which is a big deal from like the plot perspective of Star Wars. From a cultural spec uh, perspective of Star Wars, what's most interesting about this is she's black, right? And so one of the knocks on Star Wars for forty years has been that it's been whitewashed. Right, like Lando was the only brother in the galaxy, and and that's been like a problem with, with with Star Wars. And now, under the Disney banner, whether you like Disney or not, what you start to see is is we start to move culturally forward. We start to culturally move the the franchise forward. So this is an important representation element uh, for the franchise, culturally speaking, but it's also an important narrative element uh, for the audience. And all of a sudden, here's the fascinating part: I was going to give them zero dollars for their comic book, right? But instead of zero dollars, they turned me into a customer seven times over. How'd they do that? Well, they, 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 it's not because I love comic books. It's not because I love the art or the, the author is my favorite author. It's because they extended the story in a valuable way, right? And, and which, which is super cool. One of my favorite examples here in my last few minutes, one of my favorite examples is The Matrix. Right. Uh, the Matrix was a transmedia project from from early on designed to be a transmedia project from inception. Um, but if you only watch the movies, you only saw Neo's perspective. The Matrix was actually, uh, you know, a movie, a book, a movie, 20 animated short films, uh, a, uh, a video game, a PlayStation 2 video game, a comic book, another movie, a massive multiplayer online game. And then getting ready to be another movie, which is going to be awesome. Uh, and so, but what you see is all these things told different parts of, of the Matrix story, right? And uh, and they all wove together for one big story. So, for example, it, there's a, there's an animated short film uh, called uh, Last Flight of the Osiris. And the Last Flight of the Osiris is um, is about the, the first crew, different crew, not Neo, not Morpheus, different ship. Um, they, they see that the... Um, uh, the machines have figured out where Zion is and they're up on the surface of the earth and they see the machines drilling down four miles below the, earth, the, the, the surface of the earth. And um, uh, they need to warn everybody that the machines are coming. Right. So they, they, they start to fly away. The machines uh, uh, are catching up with them. And so they um, uh, they record a message. And warning everybody that the machines are coming and they and and uh Zhu, here this character here she jacks into the matrix and she um uh she takes the message and she drops it in a mailbox in the in, in the matrix the ship explodes everybody dies into the short film right super cool but so that's what happens in the animatrix but when you go to play the video game the video game, the first mission you play in the PlayStation 2 video game is your different characters, Ghost and Nairobi, and, uh, and you're flying a different ship. And your mission is to go inside the Matrix, find the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the message that's hidden, hidden in a mailbox, find it, and get it back to Zion. Right now, if you haven't seen the Animatrix, that's fine. It's just a video game mission. Mission, but if you had seen the video game, uh, the Animatrix, now all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, I know exactly what's on that message. Uh, it, I, I, you know, I saw who put it there. I saw the story leading up to it. It's much more valuable. Then, what's super cool is then when you go uh, watch the uh, Matrix Revolutions, one of the early uh, scenes of the film is the Council of Zion watching the last transmission of the Osiris. Right, the, the the transmission. Once we got it back to Zion, they're now in the video game. They're watching the warning of the machines are coming, which is super interesting because when you see that, and if you play the video game, you say, "Wow, that's amazing!" Because not only know I do I know who created the message, I'm the one that got it to Zion in the video game, which is awesome. Then, if you watch Matrix Revolutions, there's a kid who like is 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 obsessed with Neo, right? And you don't know exactly why he's obsessed with Neo. Well, if you go watch the Animatrix, uh, Neo, there's a short film where Neo is the one who f frees this kid from the Matrix, like. Trinity and Morpheus did him. And that's why this uh, uh, this kid's obsessed with him. Then my favorite one is if you watch Matrix Re uh, Reloaded, there's this awesome chase, chase scene on the um, uh, uh, on the freeway. And then, so after the movie, a few months later, 
they release PlayStation 2 Enter the Matrix, right? The fans figured out if they went back to the video game and paused the scene on VHS, because at that time, at, at, by that time it had been released on VHS, home video. Uh, if they paused the scene on home video, the, the, the road signs on the freeway scene, if they paused it, there was a cheat code on the road signs the entire time that they could then use for their video game, right? And so this amazing integration is so different than just the book that becomes the movie that becomes the video game, right? This is sort of a new philosophy of design. And you see ecosystems that are popping up with Netflix and Amazon and Apple and Disney. And the, the new studios are all leaning into this. And so of course they're gonna give preference to stories that are designed for this model, right? So what we're talking about ultimately is brand. Don't just think of product, be thinking of a brand. Be thinking of your feature film script because it's super important, right? But at the same time, also be thinking about what's the collection of other things that could support my, my script, that can, that can create new revenue opportunities moving forward, that can generate pre-awareness before it even comes out, before I even sell it. How do they all work together? In order to generate a, to create a brand, you need vision, right? What's the big picture? Like how, like how far are you seeing this thing? The problem with vision is as a screenwriter, and I know it because I am one, uh, this is the this is typically your vision here. Boots on the ground in the print in, in the trenches. You're worried about your slug lines, you're 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 worried about uh, you know, your your uh, your character description, your dialogue, like you're so in the weeds, right? This is your vision here. The problem is this needs to be your vision in a commoditized market, in an oversaturated market. Uh, this needs to be your vision. You need to you need to get back up and you need to learn, look across your IP, your intellectual property, your entire brand, and say, what's the big picture? Like, how do I generate pre awareness before the sale? How do I after that? How do I create new opportunities that can support the film before it's in production or while it's in production? Once it's out, how do I bridge the gap between the sequel uh, with you know a variety of different things? How do I uh, lean in and tap new demographics and new revenue sources? How do I create not just the five-year plan, but the 10-year plan for what this venture is? Because ultimately that becomes more important to an investor, especially if you're operating independently, right? This needs to be your, your vision, but guess what? Then you need to come back down and this should be your execution. You need to ultimately come back down to the script and actually execute a good script, right? You need your slug lines and your description and your dialogue and your three act structure and all that stuff needs to be awesome. But when you execute on the ground with a vision that's big, ultimately, not only are you gonna make something that's more uh, uh, attractive to a buyer, but you're, but but once it hits, it's going to organically grow into something bigger, right? Which is going to position your you as a creator differently, separate you from the crowd. Because what what ultimately, like I get this all the time. Uh, uh, of um, uh, well, Houston, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know how to do. It. I'm just a screenwriter. I'm just a filmmaker. I, I, you know, I don't want to learn how to make a new app or learn how to do a video game. And I can't draw and make a comic book. Or what, what do I do, right? My big, my big uh, suggestion to people is one, you have to think differently. There's this really cool word that I love called alinea, right? And, and what that means is, is it, alinea means the beginning of a new train of thought. You have to start thinking differently, right? And so what, practically what I, what I tell people is I say, start with three things. What are the three things that you're good at? Obviously you're a good screenwriter and good filmmaker. But what else are you good at? It's very rare that you don't ever find one person that is only good at one thing, right? Like all they do is is, is this one thing. Usually people are good at a few things. I was talking to a girl in, in uh, uh, from New York City and she said, uh, she said, well, I'm a filmmaker. And that's my passion. But I also am a hobby painter and I uh, write poetry on the side. And I think I'm pretty good. I said, awesome, cool. Everything that you do, every movie you make forever, you need to have an art exhibit, like a pop-up indie art exhibit, where the paintings extend the story of your movie in some valuable way, and then release a book of poetry, either digitally or publish it, self-publish it on Amazon, right? And the poetry 
uh, maybe reveals character backstory, maybe reveals a mystery that you set up in the film that you then answer in the poems, right? And, and it connects to the art and the movie. And all of a sudden you have a multi-platform super story where you never have to go outside of your own skill set, right? But you have an art exhibit, you have a book of poetry, and you have your movie, and people that's never seen your movie that see the art exhibit, maybe that's an entry point in the story that could lead them to the movie. People that, that have never seen the art exhibit may find the book of poetry, and the, it, 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 the story intrigues them, and they're led to the art, which then leads them to the movie. Maybe the people that love your movie and just want more of the movie then are satisfied because they get extra story when they go to the... Uh, 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 go to the, the poetry and the paintings, right? That's all completely analog. You don't have to learn how to do VR, but you're leveraging a multi-platform model uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a really interesting new way. Um, and there's lots of super practical strategies uh, of, of how to accomplish that and how to build that into your story that are super, super easy. You can do it for the the art house character piece. You can do it for the situational comedy. You can do it for the, the fantasy epic. Um, and tomorrow when we do the Q and a, not tomorrow, but Friday, when we do the Q and a, um, uh, if you guys show up, we'll go over and ask the, if you ask me those questions, we'll, I'll go over all the different strategies that are, that are, that are tactically contextual to all of you all, uh, which is, which is cool. There's a lot of really super practical things I want to dig into. Um, but, but usually like there's no sense in talk about all the, the strategic stuff until you're, you understand that. The model is changing. The model has changed. The world has changed. It's going to continue to change. We need to be liquid. We need to be fluid. We need to be adaptable. And um, uh, uh, we need to understand that today's market is just very different than yesterday's market, right? So here's a few different ways to uh, uh, to contact me. Uh, feel free to reach out to me via email, houston.howard at superstory.works. You can follow me uh, uh, on social at houston at uh, one through creative. Uh, if you want some more resources, right? I have a super story podcast uh, where I delve into all of these things, give a lot of practical tips, super story vidcast on, um, on uh, uh, YouTube. Um, and, uh, and then obviously there's the book that you can pick up as well. Um, but, but again, if you get, if any of y'all are interested in, in how to leverage this practically uh, Friday, I can't remember the time, but I'm sure someone will tell you uh, we're doing a Q and a session and we'll be able to dig in very specifically from there so i know i talked super fast and i got like uh wildly excited like a pentecostal preacher but uh but i'm telling you all this is like such an important thing for screenwriters to learn how to leverage so i appreciate the time i uh, hope you enjoyed it fantastic thank you houston that was uh <clears throat> it's rare that i have someone on the show who's uh, got more energy than me but you've uh, you've got that award now uh, i hope <laughs> you enjoyed it and you're coming back on friday awesome. that's right isn't it Yes, Friday. I can't remember what time, but yeah, Friday. I, I uh, think it's 5.30 uh, UK time. Perfect. Okay. So awesome. we're, we're expecting a Zoom room crammed with uh, screenwriters there. who are, are going to ask you tons of really interesting questions. Um, so that'll be fantastic.